for community engagement and health partnerships. All of us research program in Milwaukee and the Life Course Initiative for Healthy Families. Uh, she's got so much experience in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, she has really moved the needle uh, in, in, uh, for many of us uh, in, in what we hope to accomplish in engaging uh, all communities in Alzheimer's research. So I'm going, before I turn to Gina, I just want to give the floor to the, to, uh, the NAC uh, so that we can uh, get some uh, input about our uh, logistics for this meeting today. Amy? Sure. Good morning, everyone, um, and afternoon. Um, welcome to the ORCOR webinar. Um, we are gonna be using the chat feature. So if you have questions, please put your questions in the chat. Um, also it is run, it's just a regular Zoom. And so if you want to um, use your microphone, you can just click in and, and use your microphone. But if you wanna keep it on mute until uh, you're called on to speak or you have a question, that would be great. So, and, and this is being recorded and it will be on uh, YouTube in about a week. So thank you and welcome. With that, I'll pass All right. it on. Thank you. Gina, the floor is yours. Thanks for, th thanks everyone. Well, good morning, everyone. It is indeed a pleasure and an honor to be here. I wanna thank um, Laura and the team for inviting me back to come and present again um, regarding participant advisory boards. I'm gonna share my screen here um, with our presentation. Uh, and I am, should be good to go here, I believe, here we go. I'm gonna put us in um, slideshow mode and we'll get going. I want to, uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great, okay. Now I'm gonna give a caveat to say that I can't see you guys, so you'll have to tell me if you can't see something uh, and feel free to shout in there. Um, but what I wanna do is talk a little bit about what we uh, talked about last, last time when we met. I talked a little bit uh, a really high level about participant advisory boards and I reviewed the videos and I got lots of questions about just practical steps for for how do we actually get these participant advisory boards going? Give us some examples, just some concrete examples. And so what I wanna to do today is just that. Um, talk about practical steps for developing participant advisory boards uh, with SMART goals. And, and we'll talk about why SMART goals. SMART goals are really something we can all dive into as we're thinking about having community first. It's a model that community is used to. We use it in churches. We use it in program delivery models for community-based programs all the time, CBOs use them. And so they're very familiar. So I wanted to use something that I thought would be practical as we're thinking about building these uh, relationships and these in interrelated relationships with our community. So real quick, our objectives for today, we're gonna to do a short overview of, a, of what we have defined or considered participant advisory boards. Talk about, again, how SMART goals can be used. And then we're gonna break into some Q&A, questions and answers. And as I'm doing the presentation today, I want you to be clear that this is a dialogue. I want this to be a conversation. Feel free to put those questions in the chat and I will do some slides and then I will stop and get feedback and we can have this uh, information sharing uh, period at this time. So given that, here's the SMART goal template that we are going to use, which I will delve down into uh, as we go along. But this is just the tool that I pulled with basic SMART goals. So SMART, measurable, achievable, relevant, time bound. And as I said, we'll walk through each of these as I go through the presentation. So as a re review, last time when we talked, I talked a little bit about going from a community advisory board to a participant advisory board and what are some of those differences and why start with the cab first. So here what we know is that usually community advisory boards have more of a generalized kind of purpose, right? So they advise, they support, they focus on the large broadband of recruitment and enrollment. Um, in this particular model, I'm using the All of Us Research Program as a generic that we have built here. And that cab really helped us to do some outreach education in the broader sense of the term of the research. And also those cab members were not necessarily participants 
in the research as of yet. They were community advisory board members who had an interest in research, but may not have committed to research. And then again, the strategy for us in thinking about CABs are centering those voices but specifically in this case for underrepresented populations. And then when we thought about it, we recognized a participant advisory board. So our community advisory board was critical to set the groundwork to feed into those participant advisory boards. And our PABs are actually comprised of now enrolled participants in the study who actually are formed into what we have created as our cohorts. And in this example, we're talking about our men's and women health cohort. And and this participant advisory board is now utilized in a more specific purpose. And that is to help us drive research in an intentional way where we're not just asking these broad brushstroke questions about how to do a general uh, recruitment retention, but really drilling down about questions about the research study itself and guiding us into to questions that of their experiences as being a part of this research study. And then the other thing that we're building is this community scientist idea, where we're looking at how do we bring groups together, particularly by being a participant through advisory boards and building research from the ground up with the investigators involvement. And then the third piece of our participant advisory board, again, is advising and health literacy and community program. So we have some specific specific goals that are relative to participants, participants working in the research realm, and then building a, a program or literacy opportunity for programming that will impact the community as a whole. And so here's just an overview of a broad brush uh, participant advisory board, some of the elements that we know are critical. So they comprise of, as I said, research participants, patients, and even lay stakeholders who have participated in research studies, maybe not this one, but in times past. And then there's that interconnected accountability, which I'll go through when we talk about some of these SMART goals. It really means that not only is the uh, participant or the, the person in the PAB are, uh, accountable, but the interconnected accountability from the institution is now a part of this participant advisory board because they are actually the forefront and the face of, of the institution through PAB and through those participant advisory board. There's this bi-directional engaged relationship that talks about the in-depth roles and the interaction with the research team as a whole. And this happens in a very intimate way and an intentional way. And what I I mean by that is again it's not just where the investigator comes in every now and again every quarter but the PI uh, the research team all of those folks are actually engaging on a regular basis with these participants and they're asking realistic questions about how to form shape and norm the research study itself now it doesn't mean that you know they have to 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 be uh, engaged in every iteration but they should be engaged engaged in the, the critical areas of the study. And we ought to have a bi-directional relationship of communication that is understandable, that is uh, transparent, and that actually supports how these folks on the advisory board or the PAB itself can do its work to actually manifest something that will actually be impactful in the community overall. And again, the PAB focuses beyond enrollment and retention goals, but it's talking about building these institution community integrations. And then again, as I said before, we've got the, co uh, the, the PAB members can be co-investigators, co-contributors, and even part of our evaluation process. So these are things that we want to bring them into in an intentional way. And I mentioned community scientists in the other uh, slide, but thinking about how our PAD members can actually vet research, vet ideas to us, and, and actually participate in proposals and actually present in communities. And then part of our grant reviewing process, policy changes, and thinking about this whole power shift that needs to occur when we're thinking about health equity and inclusion and those and the sorts of those. So having said that, I'm just going to do a broad stroke of what can a what can a creation of a PAB look like? And we had questions uh, in the last uh, session about what does recruitment look like, Gina? What what might this entail? And 
So I wanted to give you just a quick sample of something that we have used. So when I think about membership and we talk about recruitment, how are we going to recruit? What are our, ide our ideas and our thoughts about recruitment? So what I have in front of you is is, is just a snippet of some of the things that we have put into our practices and policies. And so we have the recruitment, which you I've highlighted for you, uh, that they are equitable and fair recruitment strategies that we're using, right? We know we want to have open invitations for folks to apply to be a part of our advisory uh, board. And then we also have some set ideas to identify participants who are also representative of our cohort models that are again enrolled, but the but the participants will actually identify potential members who can, should be a part of our uh, path. And then again, I think when you look at thinking about how do we set quorum, how do we decide how many PAB members should be there? The PAB members will decide the method of selection, selecting additional members, but also setting a quorum. Those are things that we will put in our bylaws, things that we put in our charters, et cetera, which I'll go over in a little bit. And then again, thinking about how the participant advisory board We'll do some nominees and, and what are some of the criteria that we will be looking for, for the PAB members to look for in their peers to actually be part of a PAB. And these are things where we're talking about the nominees should have timely communication, ability to listen, learn, pro provide constructive feedback, and then some other categories, uh, criteria as well that we'll dive into. And then I taught, I definitely put incentives up here first because we I know that is a critical part of our conversation about how do we compensate folks. So if you know, I've got this, this highlighted piece about compensation for active meeting time. And we put an arbitrary number of $50 that every par, uh, excuse me, PAB person would uh, receive if they attended a meeting um, that we would do a bi-monthly meeting. But you will notice there's an asterisk also in that sentence that says to ask PAB participants and have a full-fledged discussion about remuneration. One of the challenges that I know we've discussed and have is that we often set, as I said, I put that, we, we put a $50 arbitrary number in there as a remuneration or a compensation, I would say, for a PAB member. But is that what the participant advisory board would like to see for remuneration? Perhaps they'd like to see scholarship opportunities. Perhaps they'd like to see uh, training opportunities. Perhaps they'd like to see something that is not even in the form of cash. So we have to think about this and talk about that as we're planning and forming these um, participant advisory boards. And then um, again, the other thing that we wanna make sure is that we do make sure, and that we are intentional, I should say, about having access to prof professional, uh, opportunities and training opportunities for our PAB members so that they not only support our work in our sphere, but actually increasing and expanding their education and knowledge base about research as a whole. I'm going to stop there and see if there's questions in the chat or if I can continue to move on. Well, I, I actually think, Gina, uh, some people have just walked in and I think you've covered a tremendous amount of ground from last uh, sem uh, webinar going from CAB to PAB. I, I think one thing I just wanna take a moment to slow everyone down here though, is you say equitable and fair recruitment strategies. And I think for those who are new perhaps, uh, like myself, to the world of community engagement, the word equitable I learned does, does not mean equal. And maybe just spelling out for us newcomers, you know, what's the difference between equitable and equal who defines that, particularly when you work through underrepresented uh, groups, underrepresented uh, racial and ethnic minorities? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. That's an excellent question. So when we think about equitable, we're thinking about uh, beyond just having one, uh, one, uh, you know, uh, one here, one there, or the same. We're thinking about looking at what are the actual needs of our community. Who needs to be at the table to be reflective of those needs? So it's not about saying we've got 10 women, 10 men. That's, that, that's equal. Equitable will say, what are the problems that are contributing to this issue? What are the disparities looking like? And who 
are most impacted by these disparities. And what we do is build, uh, or we invite and include those folks at, at a rate where we know we're going to be able to address those needs. Those are the priorities that we've, we've put in place because we want to not necessarily make it equal that everybody's coming to the table at the same level, but equitable looking at what are the actual strategic needs of our community and then basing our community advisory boards, our participant advisory board work on those needs, if that makes sense. And then we, when we think about these strategies of recruitment, we look at the current data, we look at the current uh, cons, cons, uh, excuse me, the current concerns raised by the community as well. And we begin to build our strategies around those so that it looks like the issue that we want to tackle. And with that with the people who are represented and reflective in those, in those places are actually able to talk about their lived experience in this space that are going to be able to contribute to the solution finding that we're looking for uh, at this time and to support us as we're moving the agenda uh, forward and ahead. Does that help, Sophia? It, it does, Gina. I think this brings back the theme from the last webinar in which you started to talk about a change in power equilibrium, which has traditionally centered around the academic researchers and shifting and sharing that more towards the community. Because if I understand you correctly, equitable can't really be defined by the researchers themselves. Equitable is defined by the community and only comes from you know, the community, vo the voice, or in this case, the, the PAB. You know, a researcher can define what's equal, um, but only the community voice can define what's equitable, and that may be different for different communities. Is that correct, Gina? That is absolutely correct, and, and, and exactly, yes. So we have for so long, and what we do know is that even when the community has been invited to the table uh, and has participated in our participant advisory board, community advisory boards are whatever have you, that voice can still be lost in the reflections and the reporting of the outcomes and the activities that have happened. So yes, you're absolutely right. It is critical that the investigators sit with the community prior to uh, developing even a community advisory board to understand the needs of those lived experiences and of those communities before we set the agenda or before we develop a participant advisory board and understand the needs and then have their voice and even do some reflective thinking and reflexive, uh, reflexive conversations with the community to say, I did we hear you right? Are we on the right path? Then we can talk about equitable uh, strategies. And I will be honest, um, you know, I can use a textbook definition of equity, but the challenge in that is it still misses the people. It still misses the mark by, of, of explaining in real life detail what communities actually still need. I, I think this is really, really helpful. You know, sometimes we say, you know, you can't learn something in a book. So Gina, I think it's great that you're just sharing that inside knowledge. I think it'd be great if we could uh, just continue along. And I think a lot of questions are streaming into the chat, but I think it'd be great to get to the smart goals and really see how to get to the action plan of what you're you're asking us to, to think about doing at our own ADRCs and other research centers. All right, well, let's get to the smart goals. Let's see my computer. Computer is not acting right. Let's see. I'm trying to hit here. There we go. Next. So of course, the first goal about a smart first thing about a smart goal is being specific. And being specific, what do I want to accomplish, right? Um, and and most of us to say, I want a successful participant advisory board. I want to make sure that the PAB is successful. But we're going to talk about what does successful mean, and then what do I want to accomplish? I want to advance research, right? Improve communities, etc. And but but with that definition, we still need to advance of what do I want to accomplish? We want to accomplish, if, 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 if I'm correct, we want to accomplish equity. We want to accomplish health uh, removal and reduction of health disparities. We want to accomplish a changed ideology and thinking about how community is important to research, but how community actually is not just a service uh, person or servant to research, but actually are the drivers of research. Those are things we need to be thinking about when we're talking about being specific and what we want. 
Uh, what are the requirements? Uh, being specific, you require participants. The, what are the requirements for the participants? What are the what is the institutional requirements? Uh, thinking about where where would what should my institution be contributing to our participant advisory board? We know it's something that we need, but we need to have specific. Uh, uh, requirements from our user institution and what are they requiring of us in order to be able to support a participant advisory board and what are some of the constraints we need to be honest and transparent about these time is a definite constraint sometimes our budget quality engagement with community and sustainability those are things that we have to really qualify and quantify as we're thinking. So an example is what we are talking about when we talk about specific. A participant advisory board, again, or our PAB will primarily advise, this is what we want from them. We want the accomplishment is to advise us, uh, the All of Us program uh, team on community health literacy, retention in the program, and have a community scientist in initiative. So we know that this is what we want to see happen. And in addition, they'll provide us insight on all aspects of participant journey, recruitment, retention, et cetera. So that's our specific goal that we know we want to accomplish. And we know why we want to accomplish that because we need the insight of all those aspects of the journey. And so we know in order to do this, we also have to have some policies and procedures around that scope and that's when we talk about our scope of work which is really important to actually talk about specificity right so we want to say we want folks to attend and participate in meetings we want the retention guided by the PAB, right and community health education strategy deliberate key ideas and decisions as the cab of and our cab continues to support the PAB. by the way so we take everything back from the PAB to our cab. So our key ideas from our cab go to the PAB, but then they go back after the PAB has discussed those. Um, we have, again, selective volunteer time to support those activities and events, and then operationalizing our systems. Remember, this is our institution now. We definitely know we need buy-in from the institution. So we need systems uh, you know, that generate community-led research questions, and then we'll have our focus groups, our town hall meetings, et cetera. And then the really critical element here is to always make sure we're evaluating um, our, our programs, but then having this scope of work where our PAB is evaluating our research proposals as well. And so the next piece is making sure what we're doing is measurable. We need to make sure how can I measure my, my, my programs, right? So frequency of meetings can be measured, but you need to have agendas, you need to have minute meetings, we need to take attendance. And again, going back to that evaluation and participant feedback, those things will help us measure our project and our process and our projects. And we may need to make sure that we are intentional about having those in public spaces where everyone can see them and everyone can review them and support them or make questions about them and even give us input uh, if we're not hitting the, uh, um, the mark or if we're not getting it uh, correctly. And then how will we accomplish these goals? So it's really important that we as a, I, you know, interestingly enough, I said this in the last uh, session, Unfortunately, or fortunately, this is just not a cookie cutter process. And so what has to happen is that as a team and as a partnership, we have to identify our, our own success indicators. And for us, it can be increased engagement. For instance, we are now seeing our PAB members talking about this program with other PAB members or with other community members, excuse me, uh, with sharing it with their friends, with their loved ones, what's happening in the university, what's happening um, at this research study. We know that's really important for us. Brand recognition is important, again, I believe that participant advisory boards can be the face of our institution. And I'll talk more about that as we go on. But that is important. If you're out in the community, you mention your research study and people give you an aha nod, that is a win. And that helps you to know that you are actually making progress. And then increased enrollment, of course, is, a, is, is, a, is an indicator as well. And then one of the things that we talked about 
now uh, in our conversation as a team is we need to make sure that our goal is directly aligned and correlates with our participant advisory board's mission, vision, and purpose. And that actually goes back to that first slide of asking the question, why am I doing this work? And setting those scope together, uh, putting that scope of work to develop your mission, vision, and purpose statements. Uh, Gina, if I could actually just ask you to rewind uh, just back to one slide. Um, just uh, the one right before it. Um, we had a really great question um, about getting more clarity or more information on selectively volunteering time to support, you know, PAB activities and events. Um, can you tell us a little bit more uh, about what those activities and events would look like? What's the time commitment? Um, you know, what's the involvement of the staff and faculty, you know, for those uh, PAB activities and events? Absolutely, that's a wonderful question. Um, so when we think about selectively volunteering, so what we uh, ask our participants, uh, our advisory board members is to uh, identify events that they would like to attend with us. So for instance, we have tabling events in the community at local churches. We uh, have, uh, I'll give you an example. We went to a book fair, uh, back to school book fair. We asked our participants, uh, our, our PAB members, if they would be uh, uh, willing to help table events at the All of Us table uh, or at the, or even at our Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute table to talk about the RAP study or the All of Us study, right? So we have uh, asked them to do that. And we will say this, I will say this, we don't give a specific amount of time that is required for them to participate, but what we do is ask them what do they believe is convenient for them. And we also give enough notice so that participants can have two weeks, three weeks, or four weeks, right, of time to actually think about if their schedules will allow for them to participate uh, in our activities. We also do um, educational activities for our uh, PABs. And by that, I mean, we bring in guest speakers to learn information, to understand uh, more about the uh, all of us, in this case, all of us uh, research initiatives that are going on. We actually have one of our uh, PAB members who actually sits at the national uh, PAB level. Uh, and he actually wanted to do that and loves doing that. And so you said specifically about time uh, from our staff perspective. Uh, yes, it is very time consuming. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. And so we may um, host our CAB meetings in accordance to what the community says it needs, which means we may have to work two hours in the evening. It means that we may have to work three hours on the weekend. It may mean an extra uh, hour at the end of your day. Those are realities. Um, and I will tell you the truth. It can be different, difficult uh, to calculate that and to put that into and to monetize those sometimes. But but what we have found is that when you give people enough uh, time in advance and help them understand the end goal, they are very willing to participate and, and give volunteer time. I, I think that's really helpful. I think uh, perhaps I'm sure people have more questions that'll come along about those points, but I definitely want you to continue to get through all those SMART goals so we can figure out how to build a PAB uh, or at least start to figure out how to build a PAB by the end of the hour. So, all right. And I just want to check in and make sure this is helpful with everyone. They're getting it and we are. There are lots of positive comments, people saying that they agree. I mean, I think it's going to be really wonderful when we get to the to the Q&A and, and see, okay. you know, what the feedback is there. But it's all really positive and coming in. So Awesome. Great. And so I do want to, you know, again, when we're thinking about uh, we just talked about measurable. We also need to talk about assessment and evaluation. Uh, so we know we need to make sure we're doing evaluation. We can be surveys, feedback. Um, we will we do them at each meeting, right? So we will ask the uh, uh, board, how did the meeting go? Was it beneficial? Did we meet your expectations? Was the information that we provided relevant to our mission, our vision? Did we stay in the structure that we committed to? Those are things that we can do on a regular basis to evaluate and assess 
our functionality as well as making sure that we are holding true to our mission, vision, and purpose. Um, one of the other things that we're thinking of doing and we will do are these one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, and more formally we'll do inf informal check-ins kind of like what I just did. How's this working for you? Have you noticed the thump in the road? I, In fact, I uh, can give a really good example here. Uh, I ran into an impromptu informal check-in with a, a, a PAB member recently in Minnesota. We were at a function together and she pulled me to the side and said, hey, I want to know how I could be more useful with the PAB. I'd like to know if I can bring this to my church. I'd like to know, uh, you know, we're doing really great work. We're doing really great things, but I feel as though I'm not being used in a way that I want to be used and, and do more for this participant advisory board. So we had just an informal check-in. And from that, she is now going to bring this information directly to her church. It's going to be in her bulletins. It's going to be her at the podium at the uh, at church and talking to pastor about having us come in and do uh, more uh, enrollment opportunities. So those are things that we can do on a regular basis. And then uh, quarterly progress reports definitely uh, will send information back out to the uh, participants uh, advisory board and, and, and through the form of a newsletter, we'll talk about our accomplishments, member spotlights, et cetera, uh, so that we can have constant communication about what we're doing, but do assessments and evaluations as well. Is this goal achievable? How can the goal be accomplished? So the first thing we talk about when we're talking about achieving a goal is really critical that we have an effective team an effective team internally is really thinking about a mindful hiring practice. Um, uh, and and I, those are logistic steps. I won't go ahead of myself, but building an effective team, having authentic relationships and partnerships and being transparent. And what do we mean? So what's the logical steps for that? As an effective, effective team, we have to have mindful hiring practices. We have to, when we're thinking of who we are serving, who we are intentionally working with, what are the, what is the geographic location of our community? Who are the population and whom we're working with? We need to take that into our hiring practices as thoughtful thinking as well, because we want to make sure the people who we hire understand the issues that the community faces, Two, has the uh, have may have had lived experience or understands the lived experience, looks like the community that we're working with, and actually has empathy with that community or sympathetic understanding. And that is really important and is not afraid or fearful or has these preconceived notions about what the work is with this population. Um, I think we have to employ strategic fiscal strategies. It's really important that we look at our budgets beforehand, that we modify our budgets to make sure that we have enough funding to actually uh, not only create, but sustain these boards, as well as other engagement activities that will continue this work in a meaningful way, not just a practical way, but a meaningful way. So if we want to do trainings, if we want to elevate the uh, staff's time on these uh, working in these communities, those things need to be in the budget. Uh, when it comes to talk about uh, talking about the authentic partnerships, that is in incorporating community voice in decisions and inclusion of these community assets as resources. So for instance, right, we know, we talk about hosting our, I'll give you an example. We talk about hosting our uh, meetings at community churches, but how are we including those faith-based entities as assets and resources in the overall work that we're doing. So it's nice to go in and host at a, at a location, but what else are we doing to be inclusive, inclusive of these organizations, of these foundational structures that we keep calling them and, so, and allowing them to be resources and then filtering resources into these folks as resources for us in the future. Now that doesn't mean monetary gain. What that means though is if you have expertise in an area, if you go to a highly concentrated area of a community that has a significant amount of people with diabetes and you're holding a, a PAP meeting at their church, 
we should be responsible enough to have actually uh, uh, let's say a resource fair around diabetes, or let's say we uh, fill into that church because they talk to us about their diabetes. We need to pay back. We need to, I shouldn't say pay back. I'll say give back into those communities and see them as resources, not just for our research study, but to, to reduce the health disparities gap, to increase knowledge, to help with uh, health literacy and so on and so forth as partners in this journey. And then of course, transparency is that bi-directional communication I keep talking about. Acknowledgement of limitations is really important here where we're telling the community the truth. This is what we can do. This is what we cannot do. This is what we can work on doing. We need to be able to do that. And then the community review of data. We make sure that the community can actually review the data and understand and including them as much as we can on those publications and then making sure that we're coming back to actually disseminate our findings with them and working with them all along. And I'll stop there. Any thoughts, questions? All right. So I think I think actually just uh, a, a couple of things uh, worth knowing. First of all, a lot of enthusiasm uh, uh, for the uh, use of smart goals. Um, just to take a huge step back, a question of how much is the PAB involved? Like, are they the ones that develop the surveys, the questionnaires? Do you yep. let them like meet? Like you said, we need to really be hiring the right people. Do the PABs actually play a role in interviewing the prospective staff members and, that, that you are, say, the, the research assistants you're including? Like, how, where do you draw the lines here? That's a really great question, Sophia. And I will tell you, uh, the way we are uh, forming, well, the way we formed our, our work is that initially uh, we put a, a, a framework together because one of the things we didn't want to do was take nothing to the community. We wanted to make sure we had something to start with, but it was a framework for consideration. And so, yes, the participant advisory board helps develop uh, their charter. Uh, we, we help, they helped us to develop the structure, meaning if it's tri-chair, which is for one PAB we have, or co-chairs, or the staff led, they get to help us with the, they actually determine that and we follow their instructions on that. I won't even say that they, they, they tell us what they like to see. So they actually take the lead on that. Um, and yes, um, they have been very instrumental in, in hiring. So when we, and in fact, we're getting ready to hire another position, we always, always offer our participant advisory board members, uh, as well as our CAB members, opportunity to sit on interview panels. Absolutely. It has to happen. There, we, there's we some comments here. I think we uh, all know there's been high turnover, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so it sounds like really the key is having a strong CAB and then building upon that a strong PAB but then also treating the PAB as one of the research teams, not just as some uh, you know, side along volunteer force, they're really an integral part of the team. Their voice is equal to that of say, uh, an inv a research investigator having a say in the hiring, helping you guys find a reliable uh, workforce to help execute the research they propose. Is that, is that correct, Gina? That is absolutely correct. Absolutely. I think that's great. We have tons more questions and comments coming in, but we want to make sure we get through all of these smart goals. So let's keep on rolling and we'll we'll get through as many questions as, as we can. All right. So that was achievable. So here's just a, a, a overview of a sample of policies and procedures. Again, things that I know we were asked in the last meeting, I wanted to just kind of bring back, right? So the charter um, is 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 in front of you, and I can I won't I won't belabor this. But I just wanted to give you a high, high look at it. It talks about charter development, length of membership terms, frequency of meetings, our location, our platform, and then our structure and guidelines. And then we, um, again, this was developed in, in, um, in, in, in uh, uh, how do you say, in, 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 in connections and, and in relationship with our, uh, our PAB. I'm trying to talk fast and look at my next slide. So I apologize for that little hiccup, but it was definitely done in concert with our, uh, our, our participant advisory board, as well as our CAB. Actually our CAB helped us with the development because the PAB obviously was, is not, or was not developed at the time. So it had to be in sync with them as well. 
And so here's a really important slide for everybody. I know everybody was dying, wanting to see this piece. And this is just a sample. One of the critical pieces of this, and I intentionally uh, want to put this in front of you and have you think about this. And you asked earlier about time and expenses. This is just a really small, quite frankly, budget that I, I, I put some elements in. But I want to be clear and let you know, there's a lot missing in this budget. And I did that intentionally because I wanted to talk about it. So we've got the whole con uh, member honorarium. Everyone talks about honorarium. We talk about meals, right? Hosting the meals and transportation and all those things. But to 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 look at this budget, you would think that, oh, $3,200, meaning that's not bad. Things are missing. We are missing staff time. We are missing trainings that we're talking about sending our uh, participant, our, our advisory board members to. We are missing outings. We are missing lots of segments that would actually have to be built into this budget. I, I wanted to intentionally put something that was familiar, but to stretch your mind to think about and this comes to whether or not this is achievable and reasonable to really think about the average cost of what it would take to run your PAB in a way that would be um, dutiful for the community in which you're trying to serve. And that is really important here. And we could talk more about that later, but I just wanted to give you guys the, this is the typical kind of budget that most of us see for our cats, but this is not an all inclusive budget. Did I say that enough? Okay. So relevance, <laughs> here's relevant. Is, is it a worthwhile goal? And in this question, you have to do your internal and community assessment and ask this question, who will benefit the most from this uh, advisory board? Is it going to be the institution? Is it going to be you as an investigator? Or is it going to be the community? Or is it everyone? And the answer should be is if, if you can't say that all will benefit from this, then you might wanna ask yourself, is this a worthwhile goal, right? It can't just be the goal because it's, it's, rec it's, it's, it's required by the NIH or the NIA or the CDC. It, that, can't be the, that can't be the worthwhile goal answer here, right? Is this the right time? I think this is a question we always need to ask ourselves because we know what we're required to do, but how's that timing? Do we have the staff to do this, right? What's the timeline of our program, of our grant? How can we feel, how can we appropriately equitably and trans and, and really in a transparent way and in a way that is going to be sustainable put this uh, path together and so what's the current relationship with our community and target population that is a critical question if you don't if you go in the community and people you hear lots of rumbling about what was past past um, past hurts from the community, past concerns by the community. You are, you're talking to the community about what your plans are and they're going like, yeah, no, we're not into that yet. We don't really wanna be, no. You guys need to come back from 10 years ago where you did X, Y, and Z and we haven't heard from you since. You might get that question. You might get that response. It may not be the right time to, to open up your path, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't work in the community. Let me be clear. That means what the timing is right for is to go back and try and really make amends with the community. That may be what that means. And then do we have the necessary resources? Again, the bandwidth. What does your staff look like? What's the institutional support look like? And what does your budget say? And then is the goal line uh, the goal in line with our long term objectives that goes back to the identify mission vision and purpose of your uh, path. Those are things that you really need to look at and then one of the other things about the long term objective, you have to know your end goal is your end goal just to get to the end of the grant, hopefully not is your end goal to make the community whole to leave the community whole, to build something that's sustainable and that you know, without your presence, it can be effective over time. Those are the questions you have to ask yourself. And I did that one already. And so time bound, is it time bound? And so here's just, is just a sample. Creating an outline, uh, cause I got a lot of questions about timing. Uh, so creating an outline uh, is, 
Short term, zero to six months. So maybe identify your mission, your vision, your recruitment, your development strategy, uh, your scheduling, um, and then making sure from there, midterm can be six to 12 months. Meetings are occurring, work is being done, accomplished to identify your goals. And then of course, long-term is 12 months and to sustainability. And so we need to make sure that we uh, uh, can put our timeline together succinctly and again, to, to your question earlier, this is not what you do uh, absent the membership, but with the membership. Why? Because if you put it together, the membership may be like, no, that's it, 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 that's not what we can do. That's not realistic. That Then you're gonna go all the way back to, is this uh, achievable, right? So you really wanna do this in the line with the community. And then when is the completion of this goal due? That is really a, a, a very, um, interesting question for me all the time when I ask that question. Some people think it's based on your grant, some folks institution, target population. I say, when is the completion of this due? It is due immediately. Why? Because the work has to begin now. Now the completion and the finalization and the finishing of it could be infinity and eternity because really when we think about it, what we want is our work to be long lasting. But we do have to have some timeline goals because we know our grants will end. We know that the institution may no longer offer support. And then we know our target population may not be able to sustain this because of time commitments, because of relationships, whatever the case may be. So we do have to have realistic uh, end goals in mind, but I want us to think as we're forming these things, to think of an infinity kind of thing that when you come back after this work, you've retired and in 20 years, as the work is continuing, you can still see the residual of these, uh, of these boards and that they would in somehow be continuing the work. And so here's just an example of some of the things that we, uh, of a projected timeline to initiate a path. And then here is a timeline to develop a, a path. So we've got our initial pieces, right? And this was uh, summer and May and talked about what we were gonna do. And then, and then we went and did something even more in depth to put more things together for where we wanted to head. And that is actually the end of my presentation. I do want to give a shout out to uh, one of our um, uh, team members, well, our whole our whole team, but in particular, Dr. Leslie McAbee, who really, we worked together uh, to, to pull this together. And she has just been tremendous support in this work. And so I am excited. I hope this was helpful. And I will stop there and uh, move out of the way. Well, I, I, I think, uh, first of all, thank you for sort of taking at least a, a novice like me through a lightning speed uh, uh, crash course on how to how to be smarter about paths. I, I don't know if I'm smart, but I would say I'm smarter now with having listened to your talk, Gina. So just a couple really practical questions, and I want to get into some deeper questions. Um, how many people do you need on both ends? How many PAD members do you need? How much staff do you need? Let's just assume for argument's sake, this is a regular, you know, R01, uh, five years, like, you know, how, how much do you need when, you, when people are thinking about the grant writing? So what we need, well, what we have uh, identified, and again, I have to, I, I will do this caveat and say, you need enough people to have a quorum where you can have a really good conversation, but not to overwhelm with so much information that you don't get the work done. And so what we, we, you know, we have a round number right now. Our, our um, one of our, uh, it's not. One of our cabs has 15 people right now, uh, and one of our, our, our groups has six, uh, excuse me, nine, nine members uh, are on there. So we have gone, we do try to ask them to cap, and our, ca our, our, our cab cap their membership at 15. Our PABs are still formulating, and they are thinking the same, that 15 would be enough. And they, they felt that that would be a good number uh, because absences happen, right? People fall off and they still want to have a wealth of uh, opportunity to have enough people to be able to still get the business done uh, and, and be able to be trans, uh, to be able to have transactions that are not just done in the, in the end of one and two. Now I will say this too, we also have um, 
other groups that have six people and they are functioning well. So it really does depend on, on your location, on your, um, your growth size and your opportunity and how many staff so that's a really great question. So right now uh, we have a really small staff on both sides. So uh, with my, uh, all of the staff, uh, we currently have, uh, there's five staff member. We're getting ready to hire a few more. Uh, and yeah, I'll be honest, the work can get a little overwhelming. Um, but again, when you begin to bring in those volunteers uh, that, that really can help lift some of those loads and then I'm sorry, go ahead, Sophia. Oh, no, uh, when you say five, you mean five uh, FT five team for members. one R01, is that correct? Or across how many R01s are the equivalent there? Oh, that's just for the one. That's just for one uh, grant program. Yeah, and then okay. for, for our other grant program, for my other program, I have, um, I think there's about 10 of those folks. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask a question now with the F word, the F word being funding. So, um, you know, you threw up a budget and you said, uh, think uh, expansively. So where does that funding conversation start, right? I um, mean, you know, some of us like Auric are clearly specifically designed for this job, but you know, where, where do you, where do you begin, right? You finally got your cab together, you know, you maybe got a couple thousand bucks to, to, to say thank you and covered their transportation, but, but how do you, how do people initiate that dialogue? Should the PIs be coming, say, to the faculty members working with the cab? Are they the ones that are responsible, you know, or, or does it work the other way? Should, um, should the faculty members who are like, say, responsible for the cab, you know, go out and, and be, be a little clearer with the PIs as you devise your budget? Uh, here's a blueprint and you hand them something if you like and then then you know obviously the conversations will begin but, but how do you even begin you know to start to talk about the funding question but that's a that's a good question to be honest with you and I think um, you know traditionally the budgets were set right and the PIs this is what I've got this is where I am I have noticed though I think I think now especially with the way the pendulum is 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 shaking where there are requirements to have advisory boards, that there is this space where which even I think uh, faculty can go to staff, excuse me, to the PI and say, hey, we're, we're formulating this participant advisory board and, and set and uh, precedence has precedence has been set that the average board, whether it's cab or PAB, whatever it is, has cost this amount of money. And here's what we know a typical successful uh, advisory board would cost us. Is it feasible to think about putting this into the budget? I think that's how the conversation has to start. What I do know is most of the folks are data-driven and they want to see the ROI first. And so if we can demonstrate, which I think we can, the effectiveness of sustainable and sustaining advisory boards and the long-term benefit to our research overall, then I do believe we can begin to engage that conversation about budget. Now, I am not, uh, let me be clear, I'm not Cinderella and I have on rose-colored glasses to believe that everyone's going to be like, aha, I got it. That's not what I'm saying, but I am saying that if we have enough concrete information and data to demonstrate how we can actually improve our recruitment, our retention, our program overall, our, our um, longevity with the community, our relationships with the community. If we can demonstrate how uh, advisory boards are successful in that, I think we can really help folks understand that this is a, this is a well, um, a, just a great investment and, and a well needed investment, but it's good, it's well spent money. And I think that's what we are doing now. And people are starting to see that. That That's really wonderful. One minute, Gina, three take home points that everybody who was paying attention should go and, you know, henceforth go and try and execute as they, as, as we, as we uh, have to end this webinar in a few moments. Yeah, I think three points for me is to keep it simple, right? Use, I, I use SMART goals on purpose. I know there's other tools we can use. I know to do this work, but use one is be, keep it simple with the community, with ourselves, with our teams, and so that it feels doable and realistic for us so that it doesn't feel so overwhelming. So that's why I wanted to do that. Number two, evaluate yourself. Ask yourself, 
What is your mission? What is your real commitment to this work? And why are you in the game anyway? I think that's a really important question for us to ask ourselves. And then the third thing is, how can I figure out how to make this work to do for the for the you know the beneficence of the community, right? The justice part uh, that we all talk about. It's beyond just getting research participants. This is for sustainable change policies, uh, policy changes. This is for community changes. And where do I see myself in that? So my take home is making sure we do the SMART goals because it's, it's really something that's doable. Asking yourself about your self vision mission. And then the third piece, making sure that we are keeping the community in the forefront of everything that we do and that this is doable and workable. Uh, so with that, I, again, thank you for allowing me to come. Yeah. Well, thank uh, you. Thank you so much, Gina. We're all the wiser. I'm going to hand the baton uh, back to Laura, because if you didn't get enough of Gina, guess what? Laura is going to update you on how to not only get Gina's wisdom, but the wisdom of other people who are doing equally as amazing work. Uh, Laura? Well, I'm not quite sure how to respond to that, Sophia. Thank you. But Gina, you are um, amazing. Thank you for sharing your expertise and knowledge. And Sophia, you did an awesome job at, at managing us uh, and making sure we get our, our questions answered. Um, the, just a reminder, everybody, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the NAC YouTube channel next week. So if you want to see this, um, we've had several requests if we could share your presentation slides, Gina. Um, could we uh, somehow, Amy, could we get these posted to the, uh, how would you suggest we distribute uh, Gina's slides? Gina, if you're willing to do that. Oh, yes, we should be able to share them. I can um, PDF them and send them to you. That's fine. Yeah. All right. We'll get them distributed. Um, so I, I just, uh, one message that I got that was very clear, Gina, from everything that you said is that all, all of our discussion in the last two webinars about PAB and investing in this um, community advisory board, uh, our willingness as the ADRC network to invest in this board is just a gateway for us, our, a show of our, or a thermometer of our willingness to invest in the community. And if we can't invest in a PAB, uh, we're not going to be able to engage our community in a meaningful way. And so I think this is really a great front door into opening up our awareness about how important it is to make sure that the community is at the table and that we share the power and we listen. So Gina, thank you so much. Uh, or core steering committee, thank you so much. And I really appreciate everybody uh, attending. Hopefully we'll see most of you at the director's meeting. Remember everybody we have on day two, we have the ORCOR steering, uh, ORCOR program uh, from 9.30 to 12. So please, please, please plan on uh, attending. We've got a really great program that really kind of talks about this, but more. Uh, it's all about community engaged um, partnerships. So hope you'll, co you'll come to Chicago uh, virtually or in person. And uh, thanks for your time today. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.